into what I've been working on for this assemble project as well. So I've been completely fascinated by marine invertebrates, I think for as long as I can remember since I was a, an undergraduate student in Canada and I just fell in love with them through my invertebrate zoology course so I've been studying them ever since and they're just incredible animals you know they make up 95% of the diversity in our oceans and they can also tell us something more about metazoan evolution as a whole since they were some of the first multicellular animals to evolve. And a lot of the groups I work on, we're lacking a lot of information about their basic ecology and biology, which can be very difficult <laughs> at times. They can be difficult to keep alive in the lab and so to really manipulate in an experimental way. But we've also seen just a general taxonomic bias in that we tend to know more about vertebrate systems. And especially when we think about genetic and genomic resources, we're often lacking these resources for a lot of marine invertebrates. So I guess my research program is really aimed at understanding more about marine biodiversity and trying to improve this knowledge and these resources. And for me, that has spent that has meant, sorry, spending a lot of time under the sea and on the sea, I guess, um, through some work in the Arctic and Antarctica. We've done a lot of boat based expeditions, but also spent a lot of time underwater in Australia and the Indo-Pacific, which was quite lovely and uh, hope to return to that area soon. But I guess through most of my research, and it really started when I was a master's student in Canada, that I worked alongside museums, and I always have worked alongside these collections. I find them such an incredibly powerful resource for understanding biodiversity, and basically everything I've learned about organismal biology has come from the staff at these museums. So I am so passionate about these institutions and continuing to work with them and help build their collections. I'm happy that now at the University of Aberdeen, they actually have a small institutional museum. So I, from time to time, do some curatorial work there. So it's nice. I can still kind of dip my hands into the natural history world. But today, I want to talk to you a little bit about mimicry. But because no one knows me on this call, I thought I would spend just a minute or two talking about what my research program is really dedicated to and sort of what the main themes are. Now, like I said, I'm really interested in biodiversity very broadly, and this really started for me when I, again, was in Canada as a master's student. I was located at the University of Guelph, which is where the original DNA barcoding center is located, and that's how I got kind of hooked in understanding more about biodiversity genomics. Now, I still work with this team quite closely and do a lot of work building these DNA barcode reference libraries. And I really enjoy the work. And there's so many groups that I work on, many nudibranchs, but also other gastropods that we just don't have complete catalogs and reference libraries for the taxa that we're working on. So still very much working towards those goals. I've also started using over the last five or six years, a lot of phylogenomic tools to try to understand more about evolutionary relationships and trying to look at uh, tracing the evolution of interesting traits and characters. I'm also really interested in understanding more about how diversity is distributed. So of course, how species are distributed across their range and how that may be shifting with climate change, but also in understanding more about genetic diversity and how populations are connected across their range. And not only these sorts of themes or queries, for me, these are all linked around the idea of pattern, but also trying to get at some of the processes that are driving the patterns that we see. And so I've become interested in understanding how hybridization contributes to the speciation process. Also doing some genome-wide association studies, looking for signatures of adaptation, especially looking at genotype environment associations. And then that kind of led me into the last couple of years using this information to predict how biodiversity will respond to climate change. So a lot of different things going on in the lab. I have students working on loads of different types of projects, but the unifying theme is really kind of using genetic and genomic tools to better understand biodiversity on both micro and macroevolutionary timescales. But today I'm gonna to talk about mimicry. And I think a good mimicry story starts here, which is a little surprising because these are all terrestrial systems. And I said I was gonna talk about nudibranch mimicry. But I'm showing these because these are some of our classic models, our mimicry models we would learn about in undergraduate education. So thinking about frogs, butterflies, and definitely snakes. 
And what we know about mimicry is it's evolved as an anti-predator adaptation. So often what we see is that one species is mimicking another toxic species, at least that's what's happening in these sorts of scenarios. And a lot of what we know about mimicry has sort of stemmed or derived from the terrestrial world, but I hope I can convince you today that we have some really amazing mimicry systems in the marine world that warrant attention. So these three animals are um, beautiful invertebrates that we find in the Indo-Pacific. The top two are polyclad worms or flatworms, and the bottom example is a holothurian or a sea cucumber. And these are of course very brightly colored. They certainly stand out against their background, but in each of these cases, they're actually mimicking nudibranch models. And I take this for granted a lot because I've worked on nudibranchs now for many years, but some of you may not know what nudibranchs are. And so these are gastropod mollusks. This is a phylogeny of all the molluscan classes and they're within the gastropoda, so the slugs and the snails. And they're incredibly amazing systems. They're really diverse, really brightly colored, loads of species being discovered still all the time, lots of cryptic diversity. So they're a really cool system, I think, in ecology and evolution. But why is it that these different invertebrate phyla like flatworms and echinoderms are mimicking nudibranchs? And that story starts here. So this is a Chromodorus nudibranch from the Indo-Pacific and it's sort of happily feeding on its sponge prey. So here we can see it has its buccal bulb extended and it's munching away on the sponge and it's actually stealing or sequestering the toxic chemicals from the sponge to store into specialized glands in its own body. Now, this is one example of how nudibranchs become toxic and actually some nudibranchs can synthesize or make their own chemicals. They're not always stealing them. They can actually synthesize them. But in this group of nudibranchs, they are in fact stealing them. And there's been an amazing body of work out of Karen Cheney's lab at the University of Queensland, who's looked at really documenting the chemical ecology of these animals. She recovered a whole suite of compounds. So these animals are, are sequestering several different types of secondary metabolites from the sponges. In this case, they're all sponge feeders. And they found that one of those compounds in particular is especially toxic. So they ran a series of toxicity assays on brine shrimp and found 100% mortality from this single compound called the trunculin A. And what they also found is that that really toxic compound is found just in the mantle rim of the animal. So here, this orange rim all around the body is what we call the mantle rim. And that's where you can find that really potent chemical. And it's likely because this area is sort of a first line of attack for predators. That may seem a little surprising because you can see that the rhinophores at the front here and the gills at the back look like they'd be quite tasty to predators, but they can actually retract those. And, and so they often do so. When you go to approach a nudibranch, you might see its gills pull in right away. So I think when you're working on nudibranch systems, it's really hard to ignore the chemistry aspect. It's so interesting and it really makes these such amazing models in ecology and evolution. And at the same time this work was going on, I was also working on the genus Chromodorus, but actually more from a molecular ecology perspective. So here we were collecting Chromodorus from across the Indo-Pacific. Again, this is the only area where this genus occurs. And before 2018, we knew there were 22 described species in the genus, all of which look like variations of this. So they have black stripes or spots on their back, and they just come in these really bright colors. So blues and yellows, reds and oranges. And these are amazing examples of what we know as warning coloration. So trying to warn to predators that I'm toxic and you don't wanna eat me uh, and what we call aposematism as well. And I think we learn about these, again, models like this in undergraduate education, where we learn about poison dart frogs and salamanders, but we see these same color patterns repeated in Chromodorus. So actually the genus Chromodorus is a really cool example of aposematism in the ocean. And like I said, we were interested in really trying to use molecular data and genetic data to revise the taxonomic status of this genus. We knew there were 22 described species, but no one had actually uh, looked at going in with molecular data and trying to assess some of these confusing color patterns we were seeing. So with my collaborators, Narita Wilson and Terry Gosliner, we published this paper in 2018 using just mitochondrial data to generate a phylogeny for the genus. Uh, we found 18 new species, loads of cryptic diversity, um, which is actually not uncommon, I think, for anyone starting to use molecular data and address questions about invertebrate 
taxonomy and systematics, we're often finding that that's the case. We're uncovering loads of new species all the time. And that was really exciting, but there was actually something about this study that we found that really blew us away. And it was with the species Chromodorus colmeni. So Chromodorus colmeni, the individual you see on the slide there, is what we call a typical colmeni. So it most closely matches the original description of colmeni where it was described from. But in the same mitochondrial clade, we recovered these three other very distinct morphotypes of colmeni that obviously look nothing like what we know as a colmeni. We went back and redid all the lab work. We, of course, our first thought was there's been a contamination issue here. This doesn't make any sense. Uh, but new specimens, new tissues, new extractions, new sequencing, and we kept getting the same results. And what was more interesting is where we found these morphotypes in terms of where across the Indo-Pacific, they were often co-occurring with other species of Chromodorus, and especially other species that appeared to be more abundant. So if you look at this first example, here's this unique morphotype of Colmeni. It was found alongside Chromodorus westraliensis in Western Australia. So much so that when we actually went diving in, in Western Australia to an area called Rotnest Island, you could find the mimic and the model on the same rocky outcrop, essentially. You could find both of these species together. So this was really exciting for us. And it was actually this finding that originally happened in about 2016 that kind of dictated the rest of my research program essentially, because I just got absolutely hooked on this idea of color patterns and mimicry, because what it looks like is happening is that Colmeni across its range in the Indo-Pacific looks extremely different and it's mimicking different species in different areas. But with this study, we were a bit limited. You can probably tell from the previous slide that our phylogeny is not really resolved. <laughs> we see really poor resolution, short branch lengths, and really low bootstrap support. And this is because we were just using a few mitochondrial loci in this first paper. So we knew we had to go ahead and, and get some more data, get some genome-wide data. So we move forward with an exon capture approach, which is a type of reduced representation sequencing approach. Essentially, we're getting information from across the genome, but we don't have to pay to do whole genome sequencing for everything. So it's a cheaper option. And we're just capturing those exons or coding regions from across the genome. We did this work in collaboration with Arbor Biosciences in the US, which was a really great experience, wonderful researchers and really knowledgeable. So we've really enjoyed working with them. And we chose this method for a few different reasons. The one is that you don't need a very close reference genome, which is great because we don't actually have a nudibranch genome, which is one of the reasons why we're limited, I think, in our understanding of their evolution and ecology. Um, but we also knew we were going to have issues with DNA degradation. So some of the samples we collected for this initial study were from the uh, Indo-Pacific from areas in Indonesia that were collected in the early 2000s and were in museum collections. And we were worried that they wouldn't maybe be the best quality DNA samples. So we knew that axon capture was really amenable to these sorts of museum samples. And there's lots of kind of museum genomics papers that use an axon capture approach. So I'm not gonna bore you with the details, except that if you are interested in this sort of work, we published this paper in 2020. And the Python script we use, which is sort of a start to finish pipeline, is available on our GitHub. So if you're interested in using it, feel free to get in contact. If you have any questions about it, please let me know. Happy to always discuss via email. But I will point out a couple important things about the method that are probably worth mentioning. So like I said, we had a very distant reference genome. So we used the California sea hare, Aplesia californica, which is in a different super order. Uh, we sequenced 13 nudibranch transcriptomes. And so here are 12 of those from the family Chromodoridae. And here's our genus of interest, Chromodorus. And then we sequenced the outgroup to Chromodoridae as well, the transcriptome. And then we pulled two additional transcriptomes from GenBank. So this was really an important step because when we have our Aplesia genome, we could pull the genes from the Aplesia genome but then we needed to use our nudibranch transcriptomes to kind of match up those homologous genes from the Aplesia genome to our transcriptomes and actually look for exon intron boundaries. So we knew which areas we needed to target. So in the end, we targeted these exons that were phylogenetically informative within Chromodorus. So Chromodorus is a recently radiated genus, uh, which can cause some problems for phylogenetic inference. 
So we wanted to make sure that the exons we were targeting were especially informative within the genus. And then with the help of Arbor Biosciences, we designed probes to target those exons. And in the end, we generated data from nearly 3,000 exons and over 1,600 nuclear genes. So we had loads of data to play with, which was really, really nice and a huge difference from kind of handling just a few mitochondrial genes in that first paper. Now, the main goal of this paper actually was to generate a resolved phylogeny. Like I showed you before, we didn't have any resolution in our mitochondrial phylogeny. So I'm happy to say that with the exon capture approach, which again, you can see in our 2020 paper, fully resolved phylogeny, completely bifurcating, really strong bootstrap support. And we now have a really good understanding of how different species are related to one another and also gaining some pretty cool insights into some um, uh, color pattern evolution as well. And there's a, a blurb in that paper talking about the evolution of sort of spotted groups versus striped groups, which is really cool. But in this particular uh, case, we also included a few representatives of those strange more types that looked like our mimic species. So we wanted to kind of go ahead and look into that in more detail. And I think the best way to kind of show those results is in a very visual way. It's probably the easiest way to kind of break it down. And so here I've included two morphotypes from Chromodorus colmeni. So again, these are both Chromodorus colmeni, but they look very different to each other and then very different to our original colmeni. And I'm just going to show you the species that matches the color pattern the mitochondrial signal and the nuclear signal of each of these morphotypes. So in this first example, this individual looks like Chromodorus westraliensis. That's what it looks like morphologically, but its mitochondrial signal is that of Chromodorus colmeni. And then our exon capture data has shown us that the nuclear signal is also that of colmeni. So these are congruent molecular signals and what we're calling a true mimic. And this is actually a fairly impressive case of mimicry. Like I mentioned a few slides ago, most of the species in the genus, actually all of them, except for this Chromodorus westraliensis, have these long, thin longitudinal stripes, or they have spots. So this is the only species we know that has this black saddle across its back. And our colmeni here does a really good job of mimicking this model. Now there is one stable morphological character we can use to distinguish the mimic. So we're now at a phase where if we go out into the field in Western Australia and we find them together, we can reliably identify the mimic, which is great. You might notice here, there's this white line that separates the orange margin from the black dorsal color. And that is always present in the mimic and never in the actual model in Chromodorus westraliensis. So it's kind of nice we can go out and, and know what we're looking at a little bit. But this is very different than what's happening with the second morphotype. So this is a morphotype we find on the east coast of Australia this time. It looks very much like Chromodorus burni, which also occurs on the east coast in Queensland. But the mitochondrial signal is out of colmeni, like I showed you. And now our exon capture data is showing us that the nuclear signal is out of burni. So these are discordant molecular signals, or what we call mitonuclear discordance. And there are, are sort of different reasons why this might come to be and different processes that might generate this sort of discordance. But there are two that are really relevant to this story, I think, and that's incomplete lineage sorting and introgression. So like I mentioned before, Chromodorus, it's a recently radiated genus. So we know that incomplete lineage sorting can certainly affect phylogenetic inference. And we don't know anything about introgression or a hybridization in this group. There's certainly nothing in the literature, but that certainly doesn't mean it's not happening. And in both of these cases, these produce a situation where the gene tree does not match the species tree. So in these quick little schematics, the gray thick bars are our species tree and the dotted line inside represents the gene tree. So you can see with the species tree that A and B are sister and with the gene tree B and C our sister and so we're seeing this discordance or this discrepancy. So what we did was run a program called HIDE which stands for hybridization detection and it's essentially doing a genome-wide scan for hybridization among our taxa in our data set and it did flag this individual as a putative hybrid. So it may be that a hybridization is driving the patterns that we see here. Now, I think a scenario of hybridization, like I said, there's nothing reported about this for nudibranchs or many other marine invertebrates, but I think there are some reasons why this could actually be very plausible. So one is we find Chromodorus, especially this genus, we find these multi-species groupings. So these are three different species of Chromodorus on a single sponge. And actually in Queensland, we found up to seven 
Chromodorus on a single sponge, seven species of Chromodorus. It looks like they all made it at the same time. They release egg ribbons at the same time. They appear to feed on the same things. So there isn't a lot of character displacement going on there. So it, it is possible that hybridization is happening in this group. We've also had interesting reports from divers of interspecific matings. So these are two species engaged in copulation, two very different species. Uh, so here, I think it's becoming more and more obvious that hybridization may be, uh, may be propelling some of the, the mimicry patterns we see. And from the butterfly world, thanks to the Heliconius Consortium, which is a massive group of people studying mimicry and butterflies, we know that hybridization has been really important in actually facilitating mimicry in that group. So essentially what's happening when these two species hybridize is there's this shared block of genetic variation that's exchanged. And within that block are a supergene that controls color and color patterns. And that's kind of helping to facilitate the, that mimicry. And so that's something like that may be happening here. We have only just scraped the surface. So this is again, just the paper from 2020. And now my goal in, in my research program is to dive in much deeper into sort of the evolutionary genomics world and try to get a reference genome and much more of a population genomics data set to try to understand more about hybridization, try to identify some of these color genes or color super genes. Um, we know these super genes are, are controlled by uh, chromosomal rearrangements like inversions. So it'd be great to understand a bit more about chromosomal evolution in this group. There's a lot to do from an evolutionary biology, evolutionary genomics realm. But I think there's also a lot that can be done on the ecology side, which I'm interested in is understanding more about the behavior of the mimics and the models, understanding more about toxicity and the chemical makeup of these mimics and models would be interesting. One thing to point out is it's always been assumed that all of these chromodorus are toxic and have a sort of an equal level of toxicity, but we don't actually know if that's true. So that would be really interesting. Maybe it's the case that the species is mimicking Westraliensis because it's not as chemically defended. So there's lots of questions left to do and, and really excited to, to keep doing this uh, in the latent lab, I guess. So, that's kind of the story about Chromodorus mimicry I wanted to tell you, but I wanna convince you again that color in general is such an interesting topic in these animals. Now, these are three sea slugs on the slide. Um, one thing, a little taxonomy lesson, I guess, about nudibranchs. So nudibranchs are often called sea slugs, which is true. All nudibranchs are sea slugs, but not all sea slugs are nudibranchs. So the term sea slug encompasses nudibranchs, but also cephalospidians, which are head shield slugs, and sacoglossins, which are these photosynthetic slugs. So it's kind of a diverse group. But in each of these photos, you do have a sea slug, which you can see here. So these are incredible examples of camouflage. We have this Rustanga slug that, that's mimicking and blends into its sponge prey. This is a phyllodesmium that's really blending into the soft coral with which it's found. And then uh, we have our sacoglossin on the end here, blending into calerpa. So these are amazing examples of crypsis or camouflage. And we even see cases of counter shading in nudibranchs as well. So this is Glaucus atlanticus, which is the blue dragon that we find in Australia very frequently. The side that's pointing up towards the sky is blue. And then the side that's facing downward towards predators is all white or gray. And this is very much what we see in things like sharks and rays as well. So I think color in general in these, in these animal groups is so fascinating and there's a lot of work to be done. And the mimicry system I told you about in the Indo-Pacific in Chromodorus is actually the second known case of mimicry in the family Chromodoridae. The other is a genus called Phelamida, which is much closer to home. So this is some great work that was done in 2016 by my colleague, Vinicius Pudula. And he was at the time in Germany for his PhD. He's now in Brazil working as the malacology curator at the Rio Museum. And he's continuing this work on Phelamida and we've teamed up because I'm so excited about mimicry. But just to kind of orient you with this really neat map. So here on the left, we have North America, South America. And then on the right, we of course have a little bit of Europe, the Mediterranean and Africa. And so what I wanna draw your attention to is this species Phelamida binza. So here, Phelamida binza is Amphi Atlantic. It's found on either side of the Atlantic and even down actually in the South Atlantic as well. But across its range, it looks very different. So on the Caribbean side, it looks much more similar to the Caribbean species. 
While on our side of the Atlantic, it looks very similar to the other species that occur here in the region, like in the Rhea, like Thelemita croni. So I got so excited when I saw this paper because I was working on it at the same time in Chromodorus. Venetius has since sent me the DNA for these Thelemita binza and this clenchi, which is the second kind of mimic story. And we are going ahead with an excellent capture approach in this system. Uh, again, this 2016 paper by Venetius was just based on mitochondrial data. So we're really just getting kind of half of the story. But one thing that was sort of lacking is that we only have one or two records of these other species, the model species, if you will, the ones that Binz is mimicking. So this kind of links to my assemble project and why I've been here for the last two weeks. So the assemble project I've been working on, I called NUBIO is the acronym, and it stands for Illuminating Nudibranch Biodiversity in an Atlantic Hotspot. And there were two main objectives of this work. The first was to generate a DNA barcode reference library for the nudibranch re, uh, fauna in the region. And that's, again, because like I said, I'm still very much involved in these barcode initiatives, with the goal being that eventually we can transition to non-invasive sampling, like environmental DNA, but we can only do that if we know what we're sequencing. So we still need to have these curated reference libraries to actually know what we have. And this kind of follows up from this great survey that was done in the year 2000 in the RIA. It was from Manuel and Paolo, and they actually discovered 25 species of apisthobranchs, which are now called heterobranchs. And they recorded 13 new species for the region. So it was great. It was kind of a really good summary of what we know about the um, nudibranch fauna in the Ria Formosa. So I was excited to follow up from this. And in the last two weeks, we've collected 147 individuals, possibly 42 species. That's the kind of tentative ID based on morphology and external characters and from 15 different families. So I'm excited to then go ahead with the genetic work. When I get back to Aberdeen, I'll go ahead with DNA extraction and sequencing and then uh, see what we have. And I think it'll just be so interesting to integrate these sort of morphological results and the molecular results and see what we come up with. But it looks like we're finding several new species that haven't been recorded before in this region. And we actually have one or two that look entirely new. I can't put a name on them at all. So they may be entirely new species, not just new records for the RIA. So that's really, really exciting. And these are some of those photos. So these are a couple of the representatives we've collected over the last two weeks. So the second objective of this work was then to go back and collect some of these Thelemita species, like I mentioned, kind of all involved in this mimicry ring in the region. So I'm happy to say we did that. We collected all three species of the local Thelemita in the Ria and collected 10 individuals of each. So we can move forward in the future with some population genomics. And I have the CCMR dive team to thank for this. They've been so incredible in supporting and facilitating this work. Um, I've been out there every day, but haven't been able to scuba dive. Um, I am pregnant, so that was a big surprise this year and kind of changed plans for my assemble project. But they've been incredible in supporting this work and, and having me come out every day has been great, and I just really appreciate it. So thank you so much to them for helping with this. So that's everything I have for today. I just first want to thank my collaborators and funders from the Chromodorus mimicry work I was telling you about. I want to mention that my lab is now, like I said, at the University of Aberdeen. So if you're interested in anything I talked about today, please feel free to get in contact. Prior to moving to the UK, I was in Australia for five years and then in Canada before that. So this is my first time on this side of the pond. And I was about to say in Europe, but sadly, that's not the case for me, I guess, anymore, hopefully in the future. Uh, but I'm just looking up to really build up my collaborative network here. So please feel free to get in touch if you're interested in any of this work. And I absolutely want to thank Anna, the CCMR dive team, Kamine, Miguel, Marta, Isidoro. There's been lots of people helping me while I've been here over the last two weeks. So I just thank you so much. And of course, thank you to Assemble for funding the work. And that's everything. Well, Thank you very much, Carol. It was, was a very interesting presentation, very, very complete. We, I could realize all your bad and how interesting <laughs> it, it is. Uh, now we have time for a few questions. Yeah. Um, do you please? mind, should I stop sharing or do you want me to leave it up? Please, it's up to you. Okay, I'll maybe stop so I can see people, it's nice. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> uh, may I could for the chat, you also can use it. Yeah. 
Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi, Carmen. Yes, okay. Hi, Kara. Thank you very much for the presentation. This is not a topic in which you work, but the, uh, that I find it uh, fascinating as a marine biologist. And uh, I would like to, to ask you about how, because Nutribrands is a very, is a group uh, that's uh, fascinated a lot of divers around the world. Yeah. And uh, nowadays there are the amazing platforms where we can uh, upload our images, our pictures uh, of uh, Nutribrands. Can this help somehow to um, research, to, to the research that you do? Absolutely. That's an amazing question. And actually my master's student, I wish they could speak to that because that's exactly what I designed a master's project for this year was we have all these amazing records on iNaturalist and lots of other exactly. places. And so she's actually doing a project on understanding color variation in this species that's found from Norway down to Spain. And she's been able to use over a thousand images from iNaturalist to categorize how that those color morphs change by region. And it's been amazing. So it's really useful to us. And there's this other project going on in Australia that has been going on for five years or so called the Sea Slug Census. And they get the community involved every summer and they go out and dive for, I think it's about two weeks. And they've recorded through that whole system they've recorded something like 700 species of sea slug from that part of australia and it's just from these community efforts every year and it's been amazing loads of papers coming out of that from citizen science efforts so absolutely i think it's been really beneficial for the color aspect especially and for new records right i mean i saw someone post just last week on iNaturalist something that would have been a subtropical nudibranch they found in the south of england on a dive and it's like oh my gosh this is wild we wouldn't expect that so uh, definitely it's really mm -hmm. useful yeah great great and uh, as a diver because uh, i am a user at iNaturalist and i upload yeah. many uh oh, good. brands in the, from the garden um, what I, whatever i dive and uh, any uh suggestion on how to take pictures to make it easier for you as a researcher oh that's great for me i always <laughs> like so when we get back from the dives i always take photos of them live in the lab too because when you put them in ethanol if you're preserving the animals you know the color is just gone instantaneously but in the field we're always looking for photos of them eating because it's really hard um, you know, sometimes they're just traversing the sponge or like, you know, crawling over it. They're not necessarily eating it. And so it's, we're always looking for records. If you can see them eating and they, they leave a little mark on the sponge. So something like that is always really helpful because we still really don't know much about their diet and they're really hard to keep alive in the lab because of that, especially the sponge feeders. They need possibly one specific species of sponge that you then need to keep alive in the lab to keep them alive. So anything that's like a feeding record is always very welcome. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think so into consideration. Thank yeah, you. Congratulations for the award. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Carmen. In the chat, we have we have some congratulations. So people enjoy the presentation. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm glad. I'm really glad. I'm just glad people could come out. I know it's a yeah different time and the last one of the year. So. Okay, um, one question from Bakinara in the chat. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And I think the answer is both. I, I think with nudibranchs, it's often assumed, or it was assumed anyway in the past, that they get the color from the prey, the sponge prey alone. But I think in, in these cases of mimicry, I, I think that's, you know, a, a more of a genetic contribution there. But I think they are, you know, certainly getting pigments from the things they feed on. So I think it's both environment, environmental and genetic. But it'd be great to start teasing those apart, okay. getting more Any data.
for questions, I guess we can close the session. Kara, again, thank you very much. As thank you Dan for was saying, was was a great way to finish our cycle oh, of seminars. Uh, to all audience, thank you very much to be present in this seminar and also the previous ones. And please, uh, next September, we'll come back again. And I'm expecting all of you to be here with us um, since August will be out. And that's it. Kara, uh, again, thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much. much Have a nice me. flight back home. Thank you and so hope much. hope you to see you again here in Alga. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a great summer. <laughs> okay, you too. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you all.